TorahCafe.com. Like most people, I regarded happiness for my entire life till 20 years ago. So that's half my adult life, if you will. I regarded happiness as a selfish, psychological pursuit. That's what most people think. I want to be happy. You want to be happy. That's very nice. But it's not, I never saw it as a moral category. I saw it as a psychological ha- category. I feel happy. I don't feel happy. If I feel happy, I'm happy. If I don't feel happy, I'm not happy. If bad things happen to me, then I get unhappy. Good things happen to me, I get happy. That is the way most people regard happiness. And as I said, regard it as a, uh, as a selfish uh, pursuit. Not in the bad sense, just that it's, it's good for me if I'm happy, but it has no effect on you. It's like if I win the lottery, that's great for me but it has no impact on you. I I have changed. I have come to see happiness as as much a character trait as integrity, honesty, courage, etc. It is a moral achievement to be happy. It is not a psychological state. More than that, I have come to see happiness as a moral obligation. We owe it to the people in our lives. We owe it. Ask anybody raised by an unhappy parent what that was like, and you will immediately understand my point that it is a moral obligation to at least act happy. Acting happy is really what I am, I am talking about. Last night I spoke about the, the centrality of behavior in Judaism. In that sense, too, Judaism has taught me the behavioral lesson, act happy, then you have a chance at being happy. If you wait to feel it, you will rarely act it. By the way, that's true about anything good in life. Anything. You have to pursue it. One of the reasons I am in love with America, my next book is about my love for America and its value system, is that the pursuit of happiness is written in our founding document, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I will tell you, when I was younger, I did believe uh, that there was something a little weird about putting the pursuit of happiness in the founding document of a country. I want to just tell you as a sidebar that this is one of the ways in which we are different from Europe. Europe does not pursue happiness. European philosophers, the European Weltanschauung outlook, the European, even the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, is Americans are superficial because they, they're too happy. Deep people are morose. That is a European view. The American view is there is no depth to morosity. There is tremendous uh, narcissism to being morose. There is no achievement in being unhappy. Anyone can be unhappy. How did this happen is an interesting story. I'd like to relate it for a moment, especially since Chabad is instrumentally related as it happens. I'll tell you when this happened. Let's see, it would have happened, yeah, 20 years ago. <clears throat> I was invited by the then Chabad rabbi, known as Schwartzy, known to many in the Chabad circles. He's a, he's a tzaddik guy, in my opinion. Anyway, he invited me to UCLA. I live in, in LA, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. He invited me, he said, Dennis, come, the uh, students know you from the radio. So uh, we'll, get some, uh, we'll get some Jewish students to come. I'd like you to come and speak. So I said, uh, all right, Rabbi Schwartz, I assume you want me to speak on Judaism. He said, oh, no, nobody will show up then. <laughs> so I said, uh, all right, what would you like me to speak on? He said, oh, something, uh, something light. I said, oh, really? Like what? So he said, oh, like happiness, which I, I never spoke on. And uh, I said to him, this is an unbelievable story for me, certainly. I said, Rabbi, it's, 
happiness is not a light subject. Happiness is a serious problem. To which he said, great title. That is how my book, can you show the book please? That is how my book, now when it's God knows what printing, has its title. From that dialogue with Rabbi Schwartz at UCLA when he said great title, happiness is a serious problem. It is. Anyway, I gave the speech. I prepared really long because I knew I had not spoken on that. And I knew that this would be probably the only time I ever speak on happiness. So I really prepared and I gave the speech. For the only time in my life before or since, I liked the speech so much, I record all my speeches. And uh, I recorded it, especially since people subscribe to my speeches. And if, if I like them, I send them out. And I've been doing that for about 25 years. And so I decided I really like this speech. I'm going to go home and listen. I like listening to me as much as you like listening to you, believe it or not. I'm glad you like listening to me, but I don't. But I listened to that speech, and I remember thinking during the speech, good point, good point. That's a really good point. I think I'll adopt that in my life. It was as if I was listening to somebody else. That was a really good testimony for, on behalf of that speech. Anyway, I sent it out. That became the speech of the month to those who got my speeches, and that was it. Six months later, I get a letter from the articles editor of Red Book Magazine, the women's magazine. Dear Mr. Prager, please contact us. We would like you to write an article on happiness for Red Book. I actually thought they got the wrong party. I had no idea what this was about. And uh, I call up this woman, an Italian-American uh, lady, and I say, hi, this is Dennis Prager. Oh, Dennis Prager, great. Will you write the article? I said, I'm just curious. Why do you want me to write an article on happiness? She said, I heard your speech. I said, you heard my speech? You, you subscribed to my speeches? I said, I, she said, I don't know what you're talking about. It was on New York radio. I said, my speech was on New York radio? She said, you didn't know? It turns out the station WEVD, which broadcast a lot of Jewish uh, content, one night, took my speech, no permission, no payment, and spent an hour broadcasting it. Here is the irony of life. These crooks <laughs> changed my life permanently. Had these guys not broadcast my speech illegally, you, I would not be, I have spoken on happiness all over the world. When I spoke on it in India, I remember saying, I may be the first American brought to India to talk on happiness. We have all these Indians coming to America to talk on happiness. I spoke on it to penguins in Antarctica. <laughs> it's on my website. You don't believe me. You check that out. I wanted to say I spoke on all seven continents, but there was a real problem. Nobody is on that continent. But I never said I spoke to people on all seven continents. So there is a, it's a beautiful talk. You'll see the audience. They're all scratching each other's tuchus. But one, one is looking at me, and that's what, and I am Yotze on that particular penguin. Anyway, uh, I, I've spoken on this thanks to WEVD. So what happens? I write the article for Red Book. Oh, oh, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. The woman says to me, is $3,000 okay? Now, you have to understand something. My view had always been that people who write and lecture on happiness, it's a, it's a, it's a scam. That's what I believed. The only people who got happier were the people who wrote and spoke on happiness as they cashed their checks. When she said, do you want $3,000? I knew I was right. You know what I used to get for articles? When I would write for Commentary Magazine, do you know what I would get? Five copies of Commentary. That's what I got. That's right. I will be writing for the next issue of Commentary, and they've offered me a big $100. They've gone up, plus five copies of Commentary. $3,000 20 years ago. 
So, of course, I said yes. She could have said 10 cents. I would have said yes. It's a big magazine. Anyway, I write my article. Next, I get a call from Reader's Digest. Love your article. Can we excerpt it in our editions all over the world? And I said, you mean I'll be in Finnish? She said, yes, you'll be in Finnish. That's great. Then I get a call from Random House. I'd like you to write a book on happiness. And this is, something is awry here. And I even said to them, why do you want me to write a book? I wrote one article. We really liked it. So I said, I don't have a book in me. So we hung up. But it got me to thinking, I'll give a course on happiness in Los Angeles. I'll give eight sessions of an hour and a half. If I can speak for 12 hours on happiness and it's meaningful, I have a book. I did that, and then I thought, no, I still don't have a book. I'm going to give a 16 course, 16 session course. That's 24 hours of talking on happiness. If I have something to say, I'll write a book. I took the contract. I didn't fulfill it. I sent Random House back their uh, advance, and then I went to, to Harper Collins, and that's the book, Happiness Series Problem. Why do I tell you this long story? I had to be pulled or pushed kicking and screaming into the happiness issue. I was so uh, afraid of e- a- either speaking cliches, everybody talks about happiness, or falling into, hey, it'll be great for me, but am I helping anybody? I care about the big issues, God, good, evil, America, the world, raising kids, these things. What am I going to do talking on happiness? What am I, a happiness guru? Now I'm a happiness guru. I am. Because, as I say on my radio show every Friday, when the second hour of my show is dedicated to happiness, even the week of 9-11, I spoke on happiness that Friday. Nothing stops that hour. Nothing. And as I say when I open up the hour, the happiness hour as I call it, I say the happy make the world better and the unhappy make it worse. And I'm interested in making a better world. When you think of Nazis and communists and Islamists, do you think of happy people? God, I I love life so much, I'm gonna blow myself up, right? Can you name a group of evil people that you think were happy and therefore pursued it? Happy people on the macro and happy people in the micro make the world better. I don't like sitting next to a morose person on an airplane, let alone being married to one or raising one or being the child of one or the sibling of one or the business partner of one. I want people to regard a bad mood the way they regard bad breath or a bad body odor. Why do people brush their teeth every day and take a shower every day? Not for hygiene, certainly not on the shower. We do it to smell good for others. We brush away our bad odor. We should brush away our bad mood. A bad mood is a sin. Sorry, it's a sin. Inflict it on yourself, but nobody else. I don't deserve your bad mood if I'm married to you. I don't deserve it if I'm your child. I don't deserve it if I'm your parent. If a kid is in a bad mood, you send him or her to her room and say, come out when you're ready to act happy. I don't care how you feel. I'm your parent. I love you. I care how you feel. But I care most how you act. By the way, the moment a a person learns that, you have given them the greatest single favor you can give. We teach boys... Uh, how to control the negative parts of their nature, correct? Boys are not generally born aggressive and sexual predators. The first things we teach our boys is you can't grab a girl just because you want to, and you can't punch a boy just because you want to, right? What do we teach girls to control? Generally, nothing. And that is, I am convinced, part of the reason there is more female depression than male depression. Because if you don't learn to control your nature, your nature will control you, and you are headed for a very sad life. Life is a battle with your nature. Every day, every minute. Men know it. Men know it better than women know it. I know we live in a society where you never can say men do anything better than women, but I am politically incorrect. I, I try to call them as I see them. 
And the only reason men control their natures better, sometimes, most of the time, is that they are taught to. You can't do X and you can't do Y. But when girls get moody, well, that's the way teenage girls are. Or it's their hormones. Or what is bothering you, honey? Your daddy's honey. Sit on my lap and tell me what troubles you. Instead of, come back out when you can smile, Madam Narcissist. <laughs> That's what it should have been. A lot of women would be happier, and a lot of husbands would have been happier. By the way, I, I've done a survey, because I, I, I have, an, I have a, a staggeringly large population to generalize from with a, with a million and a half to two million listeners, you get the world out there and you do it 29 years, you speak to a lot of people, plus the lectures. So I meet a lot of people, a lot of people write to me. And uh, I will tell you a very interesting thing. Do you know, in my, th I can't prove this, but I suspect most marriages are a moody married to a non-moody. Sometimes when God has shown his essence, you have a non-moody married to a non-moody. That's one happy home. You never, however, have a moody married to a moody. Never. Which has led me to the following conclusion. The moody may be miserable, but they are not stupid. <laughs> they never marry one of their own. Never. It's an, it's an absolute sociological phenomenon. Isn't that right? I mean, think, you're laughing because you know it's true. Now, why don't Moody's marry Moody's? Because they can't stand Moody's. That's why. They know how awful it is to live with one. But they're allowed to be Moody. That's mind-blowing. Now, of course, there's a fair question, and that is why... Does the non-moody marry the moody? That's a separate question, but I'll tell you very briefly, I have theories on that too. I have theories on a lot of things, and I have a theory on that one. Many non-moody are messianic. They think they can make the unhappy happy. I love you, my darling, and I will transform you from your current moody miserableness to my happiness. That has succeeded in world history, never. <laughs> there is no recorded instance of a happy spouse making an unhappy spouse happy. However, there are approximately 2,800,662,000 cases of a miserable spouse making a happy spouse miserable. <laughs> okay? So the, the, uh, the balance is weighed in favor of the miserable. The miserable do change other people. They really do. I carry this so strongly, by the way. This has become such a big deal in my life. This belief that it is a moral obligation to act happy no matter what you're feeling. Uh, that I, I, I believe it is true everywhere. I actually, I am a character who tries to cheer up my fellow passengers in an elevator. I do. Did you ever notice what people do in an elevator? They all stare at the numbers. Now, I always find that interesting. Do they think seven will not follow six? Is it, wow, look at that, an eight. I can't believe it, eight came up. It's like a Kino board at Las Vegas. But of course, it isn't a Kino board. You know exactly what's going to show. I will make some jokes. 90% of the time, people joke back, people love it, people laugh. 10% of the time, somebody thinks they're with a weirdo. I am entirely capable of handling that. Fine, it's irrelevant to me. I think it is a mitzvah, as in the word commandment and in the general meaning of good deed, to bring joy wherever I go. I feel that if that is what I am remembered as, when I had my 50th birthday, my older son spoke at it, and he said one thing about me, which was amazing that that was positive. He was a teenager. And he said, I want to thank my dad for always being happy. 
I had no idea what my son would say. None. Of all the things he might have said, that's the, that's the one he picked on. And he says it to this day. And I, if, if, when I go to my grave, and if that's what my kids and my wife and my friends remember, he was cheerful in virtually every circumstance. That is a, that's the best epitaph I think I can have. It's a hell of a lot better than he was moody wherever he went. <laughs> People counted the minutes to leave his presence. So I really, I, I have made war on the miserable. I have. So I want to say something to those of you who are moody and miserable, okay? Your life has not been harder than the happy people's lives. It has not. You think it has. That is narcissism. The vast majority of people who act happy have had as much pain as you have had. Many have had more pain than you have had. There is no correlation. Maybe Auschwitz. I'm not talking Auschwitz, okay? Talking normal, real pain. There is no correlation between that and the disposition that people have. You cannot know the pain that the person who acts happy has. I, I remember when I divorced after 17 years, and it was a very painful experience, and I announced it on the radio, and people were stunned. The biggest single reaction, two, I had two reactions from my listeners, sadness for me, which they were right to. It was a very sad situation. All divorces are sad situations, even if necessary. 17 years is, is a big time with somebody. But you know what fascinated me? They were shocked because they know the happy disposition I have on the radio, and I do. And they were stunned. You mean even he had problems? He's, you mean we're not alone? <laughs> even Mr. Happy has problems? That's right, even Mr. Happy has problems. Everybody does. As the dear late mother of Rabbi Joseph Telushkin said to the two of us in Brooklyn, New York, when we were seated in her kitchen at the age of 15 and talking about which kids in our class at the yeshiva of Flatbush we thought were happy, she closed the refrigerator door and said, boys, let me tell you something. The only happy people I know are people I don't know well. <laughs> Write that down or get my book. You can get it for $2.95 used at Amazon, all right? plus uh, $22 shipping or whatever it is. <laughs> the only happy people I know are people I don't know well. What a brilliant comment. You see, who do you walk around thinking are really happy? People you don't know well. Everybody you know well, you know how much pain they've had, and you don't even know how much pain they've had because you don't know what's going on inside of you. don't know the demons that anybody wrestles with, and everyone has demons, everyone. For this one, it's money. For this one, it's envy. For this one, it's sex. For this one, it's, uh, it's drink. For, it, it's endless. You don't know the demons that lurk inside. Everyone has them. So the people, that's why I said it is a moral achievement to act happy. Because life is tough for everybody. Is it tougher for some? Yes. But you know who influenced me? Abraham Lincoln, who had a terrible life. Lost his two of his boys at a young age. Two of his three boys, if I'm not mistaken. I think he had three boys. Well, his wife went into absolute depression, melancholy as they called it in those days, as a result. Depressed wife, country killing one another in the hundreds of thousands, lost his children, and you know what his claim was? And you watch my video at Prager University. Please put it down. It's free. PragerUniversity.com. I have a... F they're all five-minute videos. Can't waste your time. There's one on happiness. And we, we cite Lincoln. People are as happy as they decide to be. I decided to be. That's it. 
People are as happy as they decide to be. It's a decision you make. It is not a feeling that you have. If, if happiness is just how you feel, then folks, everybody is like the Dow Jones average. Up and down and up and down and up and down. So are you happy? Uh, I wasn't at 2 o'clock. I am now. But call me in two hours. I don't know. We are as happy as we decide to be. Therefore, you act it. Does that mean that you deny pain to your closest friends? Of course not. But let me tell you something about pain. All right? I became a semi-maven on physical pain in the last year. I, right now, I'm pain-free, so don't worry about me. Thank you. But uh, I had four surgeries in the last 15 months, three of them on my back, one by sheer crazy fluke on my finger, which had a staph infection. But th that was nothing. I was, out, I was out after the surgery. But I, I had fused discs in my upper back, and well, I only tell you this because I had, I had so much pain from uh, my two disc surgeries and then the third one on top, so much pain, I was wheeled through airports to get to speeches. I couldn't walk. I was, I was effectively rendered a cripple, which is not as bad as the pain. <laughs> the, I, would, I, I would, as I drove to work sometimes, I would yell out loud from the pain because of the way I sat as a driver. And I came to a very interesting conclusion because I, I, I monitored what was happening. I have very, very close friends and now I am truly blessed with a happy, wonderful marriage. And I realized there is a limit to how much pain your friends want to hear about. There is. There's a limit to how much I want to hear about. It's not, it's not a flaw. That's the human condition. So what, they would say, how are you feeling? And I'd say, my leg is killing me. And then we would go on to talk about national policy and our families and whatever else we talk about and, and Judaism, whatever we talk about. The, the, your friends have a limit. It's very interesting. I talk to parents who lost children, which is the ultimate pain, presumably. And uh, I, I remember hearing on the radio many years ago from people who lost children that one of the additional losses was that some of their friends drifted away from their life after the loss of a child. And I remember when I first heard it thinking, wow, that's pretty selfish. What are friends, what, are they just fair weather friends? But now I've come to realize it's really up to the person who lost the child to keep their friends. It sounds cruel, but it's not cruel. It's true. People can't handle, and they're not supposed to handle. They have their own problems. They want friends to have joy in life. They don't want friends to have pain in life. Yes, there's a, a, you tell them, you open up, and in the first six months, year, obviously that's going, to, but it can't go on forever. A woman who lost her son, a couple in LA, a Persian Jewish couple, lost their child, their beloved son, who was at college in, in Boston, in a, in a fluke fire in an apartment. He and his roommate died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Staggering loss. They invited me last year. In fact, I'm coming. I was just re-invited to the same. They came from New York, from Great Neck, where there's a large Persian Jewish community. So all their friends were still there, though they had moved to L.A. They invited me to come to Great Neck to speak on the anniversary of the son's death. And what did they ask me to speak on? Happiness. Now, interestingly, they had the, their, or the rabbi of that synagogue speak before I did. And he's a wonderful man. I know him for all my whole adult life. But he gave a somber talk about loss. As she introduced me, after she introduced me, I walked up to the podium. She whispered in my ear, make them laugh. The mother of the child who died. Enough of the somber. We want to celebrate life in whatever we have. 
That's your choice. I, I, my subject last week on, on the happiness hour was, what's your choice? Think about it. That's what I, that's what I realized. At times, you realize the people will say, boy, you're, you know, you're really acting cheerful given what's going on. And I would say, and I meant it, what's my choice? To be miserable? I don't want to be miserable. Thank you. That's your choice. It's a choice. Do I feel miserable? Yes. Will I act it? No. And by the way, and this is the magic, not only do I cheer those in my presence, I cheer me. I thank God I had a radio show during the hardest times of my life. I had no choice. What if I got on the air and said, you know, folks, frankly, things are pretty crappy uh, in my life right now, and I don't really feel like doing a show. I, I have to, I have to, but I'm pretty miserable. How, how quickly would I lose all my listeners? What is the difference between my listeners and your listeners? That I have a microphone and you don't? That's the only difference. Your friends are your listeners, and my listeners are my listeners. So I had to act cheerful on every broadcast. It saved my life. It saved, I left the studio. I did not want to broadcast during the worst period of, of uh, what was happening in my family. And then I would leave the studio full of life because I was forced to act happy. These, this is an enormous lesson for people to learn. And that is why I do believe that the happy make the world better. Do happy kids riot? Do happy kids attack other kids? Do happy adults join extremist movements? I mean, think about it. The happy do make the world better. I have spoken to Chabad rabbis, not, not, not their late... Uh, uh, followers there I have been honored to speak just to the rabbis and I have told them your secret is very clear happy rabbis that is the secret to Chabad's success I'm not Chabad I'm not Orthodox I have no axe to grind they are happy in fact I have a theory and that is this if reports get back to Brooklyn that the local rabbi is not happy, they give him a warning. Cheer up. If he doesn't obey it, they come at 2 a.m., remove him, and put one who looks like him in his stead. And no one knows what happened, except that Rabbi Schwartz got happier. The only movement you can do that in is Chabad, because they all look the same. No, no, no. It, it, no, no, it, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome achievement. It, it really is. They just substitute. He's back, and, the, and Mr. Morose is back in Brooklyn. It's a much less happy place, Crown Heights, than Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, oh, we're at Dayton, <laughs> hello. And the Rebbitson has to be good looking. That's the two criteria. No, 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 that's it. It's a fact. And by the way, I salute them for that. Eleven children, and she has a figure. I, ha I don't... They should write the Chabad Woman's Guide to Keeping Your Figure After Seven Children. I, it, it would be a great seller. But uh, the happiness of the Chabad rabbi is his magic. Let me tell you something. Nothing, nothing alienates people from God and religion like unhappy, miserable religious people. Nothing. Hey, if Judaism is so good, why are you so morose? Hello? The rabbis I grew up with, in not, and they're not all, all like that in the Misnagdish world, the non-Hasidic the non world, uh, but uh, they did not radiate joie de vivre. That's a very big deal. It's more than almost any other aspect of, of a religious person's life. Is the person happy? If they're not happy, there are two possibilities. Either they're not doing the religion right, or the religion isn't right. Okay? Now, I I'll tell you, I give this as a totally... Look, I'm, I'm an equal opportunity critic and praiser. 
We don't associate happy and Muslim in our mind right now. Is that fair to say? And I, if I addressed 1,000 Muslims, I would say that to them. Folks, you don't radiate a joy of life. It doesn't speak well for Islam. Hey, there's a happy-go-lucky Muslim. What? No, that, so either they're doing Islam wrong or Islam is wrong. And I say the same within Judaism for any unhappy religious person. Happiness is the best single persuasive. There are good people uh, who are not religious and there are good people who are religious. Obviously, ethics matter. Uh, ethics are ultimately even more important. But what persuades people that you have something worth following is happiness. So that is the message that I want to bring to you and I want to bring to everybody. I am animated. God, God knows how many times I've talked on this. Every time is exciting for me because I know it changes the way people look at this subject. Oh, I'll take a pill, and I don't mind that, by the way. If you're depressed and an antidepressant works, you damn well better take that pill. You owe it to everybody else. I have no problem with I don't care what you do to get out of your misery. Just get out of it. And this is a, a message that I believe if enough people took, it would change their lives. It has an impact on everybody. Ask the people in your life. So yes, it's very interesting. I spoke for an Orthodox synagogue in LA on this subject, and uh, the title of the talk, almost always the title is like it is here, Happiness is a Serious Problem, the title of my book. The title of the talk at this shul was Happiness is a Mitzvah. So Jews found that fascinating because people don't think of happiness as a mitzvah. Okay, so now you know why it is. So I was invited to a Baptist seminary in Texas to speak on this. Now, obviously, I'm not going to speak on happiness as a mitzvah at a Baptist seminary. You know what I titled it? Unhappiness is a sin. They have sin talk. We have mitzvah talk. I'm not, not, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I, I, I am multilingual. I speak Jewish and I speak Christian. I, I have been to so many, and I'm, do, I'm involved very deeply with Americans, wonderful Christians. But it was interesting that that was, and, and they found that as odd as the shul did, that happiness is a mitzvah. What do you mean? Tzedakah is a mitzvah. Honoring parents is a mitzvah. Tell me who honors their parents, the unhappy child or the happy child, okay? What would you choose as a parent? You have five kids, one is miserable. What do you preoccupy yourself with? And by the way, I tell parents at a given point, you just have to say, you want to be miserable, I'm really unhappy, I'll always love you, but I am moving on with my life, have a great day. That is what a parent has to say to themselves. It's hard. It's very hard, but it's the only thing that works. By the way, you owe it to your other kids not to be preoccupied with the miserable one. It's not fair to the, to the happy ones because the squeaky wheel always gets the grease. That's wrong. That's all you have to say. I tried. Oh, what is it? I, I get so much wisdom from my callers. A woman called me. I don't remember from where. And she said, this is my attitude to my miserable kid. Uh, I didn't make you. I can't. What is it? I didn't break. I, so, I didn't break you. I can't fix you. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that, was, that was great. That was her attitude. And that is exactly what you have to say. Okay? I didn't break you. Very few parents break their kids. Maybe their therapist taught them that they did, in which case the therapist has, will have a very hot seat in hell. But, uh, uh, but that is not the case. That is, may, maybe it's the case at seven. It is not the case at 27. It's time to grow up. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and cling unto his wife and be his one flesh. You've got to leave your mother and father. And that means psychologically as well as physically and monetarily. And I learned all this. I learned all of this. this none of this came to me naturally. I, I take no credit. I am the deliverer of the message that I learned from other people. And that's what you have to do too. Your happiness cannot be dependent upon your children. 
My, my parents, my father is 93 and, and unbelievably in perfect health and perfect mental health. It's astonishing. He's a phenomenon. My mother died two years ago, Rosh Hashanah, at the age of 89 and healthy to her last year. So it's, it's a, they were together 73 years. I, it's an astonishing thing. And uh, I, I, I was so grateful my whole life. I mean, you know, to, at my age to still have a parent is not common. My whole life, I, and I said this on the radio, said I am so grateful I know my parents are happy with each other and they don't rely on me for their happiness. You, you see, let me tell you, because Jews do rely on children. You have nachas from the kinder, nachas from the kinder. By the way, right? We do. It's a very big mistake. By the way, so do Greeks, so do Italians, everybody but wasps. In this sense, I love wasps. I am a waspophile. I am. And they do not rely on their children for happiness. It is one of the great lessons to learn from America. Ethnics rely on children for happiness but not the wasps. They love their children, they raise them, and wish them a wonderful life afterwards. And that is what we should all do. Doesn't mean you love them, they don't love their children one whit less than anybody else, but they don't depend on them for happiness. By the way, nachas from kind is a very interesting term. Everybody translates nachas as joy and pride, right? Wrong. Nachas is nachat, menucha. May you have rest from your children. <laughs> no, no, I'm dead serious. If we translated it correctly, I would wish everybody nachas. We mistranslate it. You should have rest from your children. By the way, your happy children don't make you happy. Your unhappy children make you unhappy. But your happy children don't make you happy. They make you relieved. It's a very, very important things to remember here. So you can't rely. That's not where happiness comes from, it, even when they're great. My parents were very happy that they had two wonderful sons who did this. Their happiness came from each other. The central relationships in life are horizontal, not vertical. And I don't mean horizontal in a physical sense. I mean in the sense of my peers. The greatest contributors to happiness are your relations with your spouse and your friends. Not children, not parents. They can both make you miserable. And they can add some degree of happiness, obviously, but that's, they're not the basis. So people look in the wrong place. And by the way, if you look to your children for happiness, it's a weight they don't want on their shoulders. Did you want to be that for your parents? Why would your children want to be that for you? I love the fact that my parents had their own life. I blessed them for it. They, they, they made each other happy. They were very lucky, by the way. Unbelie unbelievably lucky that they found each other and it was such a spectacular marriage. By the way, if you want to know the secret to a happy marriage, luck. Just thought I'd share that. Okay? I, I've lived long enough and seen enough couples and lectured to enough couples. That's the secret. Are there things you can do in the marriage to improve it? Of course. But ultimately, whether you chose the right person or not is overwhelmingly luck. My parents had, and they said it. They never said, well, we really worked hard. They didn't. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, they didn't work hard on their marriage. They were in love from the age of 17 on to 93. And by the way, it's interesting. My father is very open on these matters, and I love it. I guess I got some of that openness, as you see, uh, from, uh, from my house. Uh, and and uh, my father said to me the other day, because when we were speaking, he, he lives in uh, New Jersey, I live in L.A., so obviously most of our talking is by phone. And so I, uh, he, he said, you know, people say to me, Max, you're such a lucky man. You have, such, you have wonderful two sons. You have grandchildren who love you. You have... Uh, great-grandchildren who love you, which is all true, by the way. It is true. And he said, Dennis, of course that's true. But I'm alone every night. You're not here. My grandchildren aren't here. Your brother's not here. Mommy's dead. And that's the case. 
So it's a very, we need to be real. Real works. Nachas from kinder is very nice. It's not going to make you happy. Misery from kinder will make you miserable. But even that you have to overcome. You have, you have made your bed. I will not sleep in it. I have a life to live too. Have a great day. Which reminds me of one great joke, and then I will conclude and open up for your questions, comments, and brief alternate speeches. And uh, we, uh, in a Jewish life, we wish people, you should live till 120, right? So why do you wish a person, or say a man, on his 120th birthday? Have a nice day. Thank you very, very much.